What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the roll up. Today, we are talking with a very special guest, Nick Emmons, who is a contributor to the project at Upshot. And Upshot is a combination of AI and blockchain to uh, loop in as many buzzwords as we can here. Uh, we're going to be talking about the intersection there of how they leverage machine learning algorithms uh, to provide a better DeFi experience. We're going to be talking about long tail assets um, and what they bring to the uh, to the ecosystem. So, Nick, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, before we uh, dive into some of the material, Andy, how are you doing today? Yeah, all right. I'm a uh, long tail asset maxi today, so I'm excited to uh, to talk more about how we can get as degen as possible these days. Welcome to the bull market, Nick. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Um, so, so uh, your 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 background before jumping into uh, uh, Upshot was it was it uh, crypto related or or did you kind of jump in here through a, a different avenue? Yeah, I've been in crypto in in various capacities since like 2014 ish, 2015 ish. Um, prior right, immediately prior to Upshot, I was leading blockchain at John Hancock and Manulife, a couple like very large asset managers, insurance companies. Um, and we were doing a lot of research around like uh, the pricing and pooling of of long tail non parametric risk um, and and kind of building kind of decentralized insurance systems um, that kind of catered to these like more esoteric long tail risks um, and that that lent itself kind of pretty well and aligned pretty well with the kind of direction that we we started upshot in in kind of working through pricing long tail assets and and long tail markets. Yeah. yeah so, nice. Like my understanding of non -per parametric is that, does that mean it's like almost, it doesn't adhere to a certain like valuation model. Like there's no single it, parameter you can trace that, that links to the, the value of the, the cryptocurrency. Sort of. Yeah. It's, it's around sort of the like outcome and, and the definition of the outcome. So an example of parametric risk is, is like, I'm taking some, some, uh, it crop insurance policy out and I'm going to get paid if like a median kind of temperature is, is above this. There's like a specific parameter that can autonomously close out the insurance contract in one direction. Non-parametric is um, uh, things like health insurance or, or types of insurance where there's some sort of like subjective nature in determining what can close out the, the contract, which is obviously like the, the harder kind of sector of insurance policies to bring into uh, a crypto or decentralized setting. Cool. Cool. So before we, we get into like some of the longer tail asset, like models that you guys have produced, um, we we've had Nexus mutual, um, and a couple other decentralized insurance providers on, on the channel. Could you kind of like explain, like maybe you've, you've taken a look at those guys through the research that you did with John Hancock. What are some of the similarities and differences by, looking at it through the, the like centralized John Hancock lens and then looking at it through the, the decentralized uh, like Nexus mutual lens. Yeah. I think what's, what's like so compelling about decentralized insurance is it removes a lot of the, these like uh, administrative costs or, or expenses related to just the bureaucracy of running a large insurance company. Um, I, I think th this, this is a fluctuating number. I think close to half of the, the costs related to insurance are administrative. It's just because you have this incredibly large kind of inefficient bureaucratic entity in the middle of all of these core functions of insurance that's adding a bunch of bloat. And every dollar you add to overhead is a, is a dollar plus added to the minimum market size uh, of like what is viable to, to create a product for. If it's too expensive for us to accommodate some super long tail risk in, in some like specific region or in some new sector um, relative to our operating expenses, then we're just not going to be able to offer insurance. And I think what like we've seen with, with DeFi largely today in its ability to accommodate long tail markets, the same effect is carried over into insurance as well. When you decentralize the core functions, when you, when you kind of codify those administrative expenses to make them uh, like smart contracts, you significantly lower the like theoretical overhead of offering insurance and, and in doing so like, like greatly expand the applicable markets that you can offer insurance to. So you, you essentially open the door to a bunch of new long tail markets um, that uh, a large inefficient kind of existing or, or incumbent uh, insurance company would have a more difficult time offering coverage for. 
Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's a uh, there there's a big problem there with um, the insurance companies and in, in the bull when when everything was good, but then the hacks kind of happened and people stopped wanting to provide cover and um, yeah, just overall was kind of a slowdown there in the insurance realm. Do you think that's going to pick back up like significantly in the future? I mean, clearly, smart contract risks are you know a problem amongst others. You know, it, is the future bright for crypto insurance protocols and DeFi insurance, or is it kind of like a, a tough, tough uh, industry to crack as far as obtaining underwriters? Yeah, I, th- I think I think it's bright. I think insurance is, uh, I think, the second largest kind of pool of capital behind pension funds in, in the U.S. at least. And it is a like a very sizable industry that it, it does guide a lot of our economic markets. So I, I think as crypto matures as a like a financial sector, so will insurance just naturally. Um, I think there's been a lot of information asymmetry that's led to, to sort of the, the limited growth of insurance in the space. I think there's like generally just a, a, like a, a lack of risk aversion in the space today. I mean, we're, we're all kind of DGENs just throwing money around in, in random contracts. So insurance tends to not be the first thing on, on a lot of the kind of existing uh, base of crypto's minds. I think as institutions get more involved, I think as, as crypto matures as an industry, we'll see a, like a, a more well-rounded perspective in, in kind of considering insurance or, or hedging in, in the kind of day-to-day of, of the like financial risks that people are taking. So when it comes to long tail assets and ensuring like, like what happens with those, what, what is the general approach when you, when you take a look at a longer tail asset, how do you, how do you consider it? How do you value it? How do you insure it? Yeah, it depends on the uh, on the risk quite heavily. I think this is where AI like plays a a, a big role because AI is is the most deflationary technology we we've, we've like ever had access to. It allows us to make sense of massive amounts of information in a highly sophisticated and a highly efficient way. And so in these long tail markets where we had kind of sparse data, we had um, a, a kind of like lack of, of track record or history to go off of, we can make sense of, of like increasingly sparse data sets um, in increasingly kind of like accurate or intelligent ways. And so I think it's a matter of, of leveraging the, these kind of new tools that we have access to now in kind of advanced AI models, advanced quant models um, to, to uh, develop a, a kind of more comprehensive perspective around long tail markets. Um, so I, I think that's a lot of what goes into it. Got it. It it's so cool to like start to see like how these these like two technologies that like bring capital efficiency to the market start to intertwine and interplay together. And and it's yeah. still yeah like it, it it's it's still like just kind of like emerging. Um, so I'm curious like what. Like, what's your vision at Upshot? Like, as it, it sounds like to to accurately value some of the some of the assets that don't have a lot of data or very clear valuation models, we can use AI to to start to draw some parallels and conclusions about the value of these tokens. How, how are you incorporating that into the model that you guys have at Upshot? Yeah, so that, that's a lot of like what our, our kind of core models do is, is we start from this kind of valuation problem is we have a, a, a kind of incomplete perspective on what the value of some long tail asset is. Let's fill in the gaps using kind of the historical data sets we have ac- access to, sentiment, the um, like semi-reliable order book data. We have access to a bunch of this different data that we're, we're kind of developing, uh, capturing and enhancing, frankly, through our models. Um, and then we, we kind of develop this value for, for these different assets. And then with a, a more reliable notion of value in hand, you can start to treat them at least like a bit more like a, a more fungible or liquid asset. start to build kind of sophisticated market making strategies, trading strategies, lending strategies. I think in, in general where DeFi has really like found a, a, a level of product market fit is in the long tail. It, allows us to remove a lot of the overhead that goes into kind of active management of capital. I think uh, a good example is just AMMs in general. Previously, where market making requires some 
uh, knowledge of market making, the capital as well, active management of market making strategies, infrastructure, et cetera, in order to provide liquidity to any asset, which all these things kind of add to the overhead of that operation. AMMs via smart contracts allow market making to be as inexpensive as as sending gas to deposit liquidity into a, a smart contract. And so now the, those expensive operations that limited the number of assets we could provide active market making strategies uh, for expands like considerably because now it, it's so inexpensive to provide liquidity to an asset. As we really start to get into the long tail, curves and, and pricing logic that can be codified on chain is just going to be too minimalistic to uh, support a lot of these assets. And so we need a more robust um, technology as AI um, to, to start, sort of realize the, the same kind of value that AMMs have brought to a, a lot of kind of long tail DeFi assets. Um, XYK doesn't apply to NFTs as, as easily as it does to a fungible asset. And so having an ML powered pricing rule that can be uh, interacted with on chain allows people to uh, uh, create circumstances or create situations similar to that of AMMs. One click market making provide liquidity in super inexpensive ways to a much larger set of assets and do this across the financial stack. Spot market making, I think, is just one example. Yeah. And isn't uh, isn't the, the beauty of using like an AI tool is that a lot of the the value that comes with something like an NFT or even any of these arbitrary assets uh, on chain can be very subjective based on someone's taste. Um, where the AI and the ML doesn't really have a a, su a subjective preference for uh, colors or a different schematic that it like hits your brain with with some dopamine when you look at it. So that kind of AI modeling, up, it, it removes the human error aspect and also creates a more transparent and like fair playing ground. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think at the end of the day, like, like humans are all, or, or people are always going to be the ones interacting with markets. That subjective taste is always going to be revealed through market prices, different types of market interactions. And what's nice about AI is, is it can look to this kind of great arbiter of truth we have, which is the open market, and, and uh, uh, kind of understand these subjective tastes around things that, that may not be kind of immediate, immediately clear by just kind of analyzing market data. So, so yeah, I, I agree. And I think like still using the underlying market as, as this really robust kind of arbiter of truth for developing a more kind of nuanced perspective of, of kind of new types of assets is still a core piece of a lot of this. I wonder if, if AI can detect some of the patterns that like really like provide lots of dopamine. It's kind of a double. Yeah. Issue. I, I think so. I, I mean, any, any like data that we use to like understand like what, what drives dopamine, what, what doesn't drive dopamine AI is able to like get access to that, that kind of data and make sense of it in just like a, a more sophisticated and efficient way. So yeah, I definitely think so. Hmm. Cool. So s switching gears a little bit, I'm, I'm curious, uh, like is the appetite for some of these market making strategies and these pricing models, is that in demand mostly on the, the institutional side or is that more of a retail demand that you've seen in the market? Um, I think to date NFTs have just like biased slightly to retail in general. So I think that's where we've seen a lot of long tail appetite. Um, but I, I think there is like an opportunity for like considerable returns as, as people deploy in, in long tail uh, assets. So I, I think we'll start to see more institutions enter it. I think we've seen this with DeFi largely over the past three years is, is an appetite to get access to, kind of long, t long tail uh, type returns by interacting with long tail markets if, if the infrastructure is there. And so I think we'll start to see uh, like more institutions uh, get into these, these especially long tail markets as the infrastructure matures a little bit more. Very cool. Awesome. Is there, is there anything like uh, that, you find particularly exciting or, or really compelling about the industry and DeFi and NFTs aside from Upshot? 
Yeah, I, I mean, this is this might be a little biased, but I, I do think that like we're starting to see more of this across the space of of bridging AI and crypto in a lot of ways. I think obviously like AI has been at the forefront of, of like most people's minds over the past year plus, um, and, and it's been getting a lot of attention. But I, I do think there is like a, a part of AI that is is kind of immediately applicable to crypto today in these kind of narrow AI sectors or, or like. Um, I, I guess, like more structured models, AI, like while generative AI, like the, these kind of transformer based models are, are like really fun to play with and, and really interesting. And they're progressing at a really fast pace. They're not quite production ready yet for a lot of different use cases. I think we're still trying to figure out like where generative AI, slot, generative AI slots in, um, how it can be used, how to make it sort of as robust as it needs to be, but more structured and, and narrow models, I guess, are used in, in most parts of the financial system today. And they're much more tractable um, kind of technologies to build in more trustless and verifiable form factors. And so I, I think we're starting to turn a corner in bridging AI to DeFi in a really meaningful way and starting to see these kind of focused experiments around how AI can increase yields across DeFi, enable fundamentally new financial primitives. And over the next year, we'll start to see a lot of this stuff come to market in really meaningful ways and usher in a kind of like DeFi 3.0 of, of AI kind of marrying DeFi um, and, and a, a, like a new design space entirely emerging as a result of that. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, Rob, that's the uh, very similar to what uh, Mosaic is doing. They've got AI optimized vaults where the AI kind of chooses the strategies based on what it sees and the and what kind of data it's processing. Yeah, and they're like those targeted approaches are only starting to like emerge. Like the the large language models, the the generative AIs, like obviously the Chat GPTs, like those do so well with language and, and uh, like literary styles, but you ask it a math question and it struggles. Like you gotta, you gotta tell it to like double check its work and stuff. So it, it makes exactly. It and they're, they're like, like you're saying, Nick, like there aren't quite targeted models that are structured for data sets for numbers. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully like we start to see either like a, a solution that is able to handle both or there's like more optionality that comes out where you can you can choose a, a generative AI model that is targeted for numbers and data sets. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I think we'll start to see a lot of this. I, I think like this this like new field of zk ML has started to emerge as well. Um, and the the types of models that are especially kind of capable at dealing with financial data are, are kind of tree based models. Um, instead of uh, uh, kind of like these generative large language models. And the, the benefit of that as well is, is they're considerably smaller as well. And so they're much easier to kind of build inside of a, a ZK circuit or a ZK proof system. And I think that is a big piece of, of bridging AI to crypto. AI remains this black box that is this kind of trusted party in, in anything that it interacts with. And in order for it to like, be a viable kind of piece of a decentralized ecosystem, it needs to be built in like a more trustless and verifiable way. We need to verify that a price or a strategy that is the result of, of some AI model, then uh, it, it is actually the result of that. It is kind of verifiable um, to a larger degree than, than what we have access today. Yeah. I mean, that's a wild thought that I've never really even thought of, right? It's just crazy. That's the AI models that we have today, like the, the LLMs and the others are, are all just operated by some entity, um, Sam Altman's WorldCoin <laughs> eye scanning orb. You're gonna yeah. steal your girlfriend in the metaverse. <laughs> yeah, like that's just we just can't have that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I think if we if we really want to like build a decentralized financial system and just like a, a, a decentralized world that is as capable as as the traditional world and these closed systems, we need to bring the kind of capabilities of, of closed AI to, to crypto in a, like a, a verifiable and trustless way. I think that that's incredibly important for us, like realizing this future. Yeah, yeah, totally. How about everybody that left crypto for AI and the bear? Now we're about to pump their faces off and they're going to come back and buy the top, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're going to come back soon for sure.
<laughs> I love it. Oh, man. There, there's a few other projects that have just like started to like break into that like intersection of AI and crypto. Like, uh, there's there's one uh, there's one team that's running a Linux VM, uh, and they built Chain GPT. So it's it's oh, essentially the the verifiable uh, link between input and output. So you can trace. Okay, this input generates this output because that proof is generated on chain. Um, there's another project called Uma that's doing like uh, like fact checking. Uh, so mm -hmm. from a large language model, you can basically like call a dispute. Um, and then that goes into this dispute verification mechanism. And it'll tell you like based, it'll kind of ask like a, a bunch of human verifiers to see like, was this thing real? Is this thing misinformation? Give you a, mm -hmm. give you a rundown there. Then the last one that I want to mention is AI swap. I This is kind of like low key. I, he I heard about it at a hackathon and it's a large language model plugged into Uniswap. So instead of mm. selecting uh, like token A, token B, you type in it, what you want to do. Swap from this token to this token or bridge from this chain to that chain. Um, and it, it does it for you. Like the large language model interprets the, the language tr of the transaction and then executes that transaction on chain. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I think I think AI will will kind of uh, be used in these like new intent based paradigms really heavily. Yeah. I, I think like intents and AI are kind of a perfect marriage. I think that's sort of the like the first meaningful use case of generative AI kind of entering the the crypto space is is via intents. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Well, uh, I think we're coming up here on on time, Nick. Where where can our community get involved and uh, join the Upshot Revolution? Yeah, I think uh, Upshot.xyz the the website is is the best place to start. Um, jump into our Discord. There's a lot of stuff happening around um, kind of bridging AI and crypto, and how to think about kind of uh, like what new DeFi primitives, what new DeFi innovations become unlocked when, when AI becomes a, like a more usable primitive in that space. I gotta check that out. I forgot about XYZ. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Nick, for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me guys. Cheers. Thanks, Nick.